Watch this. Ahead on your Friday edition of the 208, changes may be coming for young Idaho voters. The governor just signed a law to limit the types of IDs they can use at the polls. Now a group is planning to sue the Idaho Secretary of State's office. You may be out of luck trying to find green beer in some downtown Boise spots today, and it's not because there's a sellout or shortage. There's a battle brewing between downtown bars and beer wholesalers. And yes, this all ties back to something at the State House. And while it's a big night out for lots of people on this St. Patrick's Day, it's also an enormous night on the ice at the Idaho Central Arena. We've got a preview on what the Steelheads are shooting for this weekend as they chase regular season history. Well, happy Friday. So glad you are here with us. Of course, on tap, we got house bills, hockey and history a perfect combination on this St. Patrick's holiday. But let's start over at the Idaho State House. It is actually a really busy day, especially for a Friday. Some action from Governor Brad Little is drawing attention and potential court action. Little signed into law House Bill 124. That now law removes the use of student ID as an acceptable form of personal identification at the polls. Lawmakers who supported the idea touched on concerns of security checks and proof of ID when students go get a student ID, verifying who they are. They also point out that there is only 104 voters in Idaho that use student IDs at the polls for the 2022 general election, an election in Idaho that included the race for governor. So a big cycle is their point. So that is the law of the land in Idaho coming up on July 1st, but there'll be no more student IDs at the polls. The question is though, will it remain the law of the land? The group March for Our Lives Idaho filed a lawsuit that challenges the legality of the new law, and they are suing the Idaho Secretary of State, Phil McGrain. So the legal complaint goes into detail as to why they are suing, and they write this in their suit, quote, House Bill 124 violates the 26th Amendment because it was motivated by a discriminatory purpose. It was adopted in response to an unprecedented wave of political activism by young Idahoans, alongside other measures like restrictions on legislative testimony by young people that represent a clear backlash to that activism. It continues. It surgically targets young Idahoans and makes it harder for them to vote because they are far more likely to have student identification and to lack other accepted forms of voter ID than older voters. The lawsuit continues saying, finally, it is inexplicable on other grounds because the acceptance of student ID has not caused a single documented problem in the 13 years since Idaho began requiring voter identification. Simply put, the lawsuit says there was no real problem to be solved and the solution to the made up problem was both under and over inclusive of the concerns raised, including concerns about double voting and the security of student identification. So there was talk in the legislature about a sort of remedy to changing the law. The Idaho Secretary of State's office supported legislation that would require the Idaho Department of Transportation, ITD, to issue no fee free state ID cards to qualifying individuals for the purpose of complying with things like voter registration and voter ID requirements. Now, students are a major group targeted with the concept and that legislation actually had a hearing this morning and is still very much in play. Secretary of State Phil McGrain and I had a short conversation a short time ago and he told me that he is still very much pushing for the free state IDs for the purpose of voting and in a full statement his office says the following quote. Our office has not received the legal complaint, so it's hard to address their specific concerns until we see the documentation. Secretary McGrain takes great pride in protecting the right of every legal voter in Idaho to cast their vote. As the session nears an end, we are working on legislation to enhance both access and security in Idaho elections. Sticking with the legislature, of course, it is a St. Patrick's Friday, so I'm sure some of you will go out tonight in search of some green beers and beverages to enjoy. If you're in the city of Boise, though, Idaho's capital city, if you're looking for that, it might be tough in downtown because some establishments, they won't have any help for the green beer. In fact, 
They might not have a lot of beer at all, green or otherwise. Some establishments, bars and lounges, things of that nature, they are boycotting using draft beer in response to a law that is making its way through the Idaho State House. Senate Bill 1120 would change how Idaho handles liquor licenses. The proposal, which already passed the entire Senate and a House committee, is a vote away from heading to the governor's desk. If passed, it would remove the option for liquor license owners to sell their license, which can hold huge value. We're talking major six figures here. Advocates for the idea say this is about correcting the state liquor license system, something they believe has gotten out of hand with the speculative market on the finite amount of licenses the state of Idaho has. So bar owners are cutting off the draft beers to send a message. We found out that the beer wholesalers are the one that wrote this legislation. They co-wrote it with their executive director. And so many bars are participating and basically not, not allowing taps anymore. They're doing a tap boycott of draft beer with all the beer wholesalers in the whole state. And it's going to spread and spread and spread because basically they devalued our licenses and it's waiting to hit the house floor. I also spoke with the owner of the Corner Club up in Moscow, Idaho, a bit earlier, and he told me that he knows that there needs to be talks about the liquor system in Idaho, but that he and other bar owners across the state feel that the conversation on the topic has been rushed and failed to get quality input from major stakeholders who the law could impact. The law is waiting again for debate and vote in the full house. We will circle back next week when that's on the agenda. Well, Trevor's Law is now being fully implemented, and this is the focus of our Sunday Viewpoint program coming up here on 7. The Idaho boy that the law is named after is now 33 years old. Trevor Schaefer was diagnosed with brain cancer in 2002 when he was only 13 years old. He and his family believe that contaminated water where he grew up in Valley County caused his cancer. It's been seven years since Trevor's Law was signed into law, and now the CDC, they're revising their guidelines and getting those in place. In the old guidelines, when a state or local health department um, received a cancer cluster concern, they could easily uh, turn away that concern because it was very hard to uh, define a cancer cluster because it had to be all of the same type of cancer. Uh. So with this new addition, um, the introduction of unusual patterns of cancer, um, it can include multiple types of cancer in an area, which is a lot easier to prove and define. So coming up this Sunday morning at 9 a.m. on Viewpoint, we're going to hear from Schaefer. He talks to our Doug Petcash about the impacts that Trevor's Law could have on dealing with childhood cancer clusters in communities, his long journey to the point, and the mission of his foundation. That coming up Sunday morning. Well, switching topics here. It's a big Friday night down at the Idaho Central Arena. The league-leading Idaho Steelheads are set to host the Orlando Solar Bears. It's game two tonight of a three-game weekend set. Idaho came away with a, thr a thrilling Wednesday night victory, a comeback win after they tied the game in the third period late, and then they had an overtime winner from Justin Miziak. And the Steelheads have major aspirations for a deep run into the Kelly Cup playoffs, but they are also chasing regular season history. An overtime game-winning goal Wednesday night capped off a late comeback for the Idaho Steelheads. Justin Miziak tallied his 11th goal on the year, a shot that trickled between the goaltender's pads. Resiliency is uh, it's incredible. Uh, the guys fight to the last minute of the game and can't ask for a better group to play with. Late in the third period, Idaho trailed the Orlando Solar Bears 4-3. But Wade Murphy found a way to tie it up with time ticking down. We, just, we, can't, uh, we can't worry about it. We have to go out there and play uh, 20 minutes of steel at hockey. We know what we're capable of, capable of, and we've been in this position many times before. So, you know, we just went out there and played our game, and it paid off. With time running out in the overtime period, Miziak raced down the ice as Idaho fans stood on their feet. He details the thought process of pushing for the game winner. They were, uh, they were uh, rushing it up in our zone, and uh, I think Willie made a nice uh, defensive play, poked it off his stick, and we were able to create a little two-on-one in there. And I was looking for him, but uh, I thought the shot would have been better, and luckily it went in. The win Wednesday keeps Idaho in first place on all levels, the Mountain Division, Western Conference, and the entire ECHL. In the standings, Idaho sits at 95 points on the year. In hockey, teams get two points for a win, one point for an overtime loss, and no points for a regulation loss. So with 14 games remaining in the regular season, Idaho sits 21 points out of tying the all-time record for most points in a regular season. 
The 0102 Louisiana Ice Skaters finished the year at 116 points. Idaho can match that all-time record if they win 11 out of the next 14 games. And that quest continues Friday night against Orlando, a tough team also chasing a playoff spot. With the regular season winding down, the Solar Bears sit only six points out of a playoff spot. So a lot on the line this weekend as the teams will play game two of their three game set Friday night. So what's the key to winning game two? Let's ask the OT hero from Wednesday. Yeah, I think a big thing is just playing a full 60. As you see, we took a few minutes off and, uh, you know, they got a few goals. So if we could play a full, complete 60 minute game, I think we can take it to them. Puck drop tonight at the Idaho Central Arena is at 7.10 p.m. Idaho and Orlando will go again tomorrow at 7.10 as well. Should be a big night in downtown Boise. St. Patrick's Day celebration, of course. So watch out for some traffic and parking. Steelheads, though, expecting another sold-out crowd. And as Idaho approaches the playoff run, go join the fun during the home games. Crowd will be loud with the chorus of cowbells tonight. We'll see you down there. Idaho Fishing Game has been around for a long time, and today the job might be a little safer than it used to be, like when a deputy game warden went missing forever. We shared this story with you earlier this week, but today we have an update. After the break, we'll tell you about a warden that's being honored twice for his service. Plus, don't forget to send us your comments and questions. We'd be lucky to have them here on the St. Patrick's Day holiday. Keep it clean, keep it concise, and we'll include all of them at the end of the show, or as many as we can. And don't forget, hashtag 208 and your name. You know the number, 208-321-5614. Well, distance can give us a different perspective, whether that distance is measured in miles or time. Two separate memorials are tracing the steps of an Idaho Fish and Game Warden and adding his legacy to their roster. This summer, Ellsworth Teed will be added to the Idaho Peace Officers Memorial in Meridian and the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial in Washington, D.C. It's a unique honor for a Fish and Game Warden, made even more unique because he likely died about 90 years ago. So why the honor now? Lots to unpack here. Here's our Andrew Bartline. Memorials are to remember, but the monumental stories must first be preserved. I actually hadn't heard of him either. In order to be honored. We have a conservation officer that had done, you know, all the research to uh, kind of understand who Teed was, what his story was, what we did and didn't know about him. Born a Clearwater County boy in 1894, Ellsworth T turned to Shoshone County to embark on a new career. Maybe the first full-time uh, deputy game warden. It was Wild West. People uh, at that time were more readily committing wildlife crimes, and so he was stepping into uh, some risky situations. A situation highlighted in the press and panhandle lore. So this was on everybody's radar at that time. And it started with what was on Teed's radar in 1934. Unlawful killing of deer was found when they came across three shallow graves that contained the carcasses of the deer killed. 
Teed left early Tuesday to investigate the poachers. He told his wife he'd be home that afternoon. You know, the fact that he went into the woods on what would appear to be a typical kind of day for him, and that was it. That was all that was known. Teed's wife never saw him again, but his car, coat, and lunch were located in Mullen with initial reports of a supposed struggle. There was no specific evidence that was discovered that indicated what had happened, which led to a lot of the speculations. Ah, the speculation. Like the anonymous Spokane man who told the sheriff Teed was walking along a highway from Republic Washington to Canada a month later, or this one the teed had been slain by game poachers. Is that kind of what you guys ran into of trying to figure out what's verified and what's not? It is, and a, and a lot of the stories, if you read through them, there were you know, allusions to hot clues and sightings of teed that uh, at the time law enforcement didn't really give any weight to based on, on what they knew. Hot clues? Nothing's hotter than that spelling. I think they are the same. I don't know why they chose to spell them that way. We don't know what that hot clue was either. The department makes it clear to carry on the search for Teed until the man is found. So the search team grew to 1,000 people, highlighted with bloodhounds and resources from Washington to Montana. A newspaper in Wallace even called it the greatest manhunt ever conducted in the Coeur d'Alene district. Mines were shutting down so that the workers could go and help with the search. There were you know, your everyday civilians that were heading into the woods. There was a lot of support and a lot of desire to to find him uh, and, and figure out what happened. So it was kind of a, a thing that brought the community together to try to figure out what happened to Teed. But they never did. Those hot clues turned cold and the $100 reward produced no new direction. The department even appointed a new warden that same year. Do you think we will know what happened at some point? I certainly hope so. Uh, I, I don't know, but I certainly hope so. Idaho Fish and Game organizing Ellsworth Teed's story to the best of their ability has officially landed him on the Idaho Peace Officers Memorial in Meridian. That ceremony will be on May 18th. Also for you, Teed's family saw our story this week and they reached out to us. They wanted to let us know that they appreciated the story. And just this week, Idaho Fish and Game says a new credible source has spoken up with additional details about what happened to Teed. Fish and Game says the case is reopened, so if you or someone you know may have any information, any at all, it could help, let Fish and Game know. They want to hear from you.
Well, just starting out, thinking a little bit about your weekend here. And as you're looking out here, this is the uh, sawtooth camera, Stanley. As you look out through this area, you can even see the sun's rays along through there. Beautiful day, but look at all the snow, right? Well, that's what you can expect in any of the Idaho mountains if you haven't been up there. And we're expecting more. This is a look at the future cast showing what's happening, what's brewing out into the west. You can see the northwest here in Boise. And this is what's coming in. Let's stop it here with the timing on Sunday evening. It shows snow, rain, mainly rain from the valley, much more rain and snow for the mountains of Northern California. Another band that's going to be coming through for next week and even somewhat of an atmospheric river that's starting to develop heading toward California. We'll see some of that moisture coming up here for Southern Idaho. It's uh, really not the position to see again, especially for California. Here in Idaho, we're going to be adding to that count as far as the moisture is concerned and showing you here the future cast with a closer look just down here to the valley. So you can kind of expect some of the timing on this tomorrow. As you see in the afternoon, clouds are there, but they start to clear up just a little bit and this is just before the next storm. So let's look at Sunday. Sunday morning you get up, you're going to be pretty much cloudy around the entire area. Just cloudy, but a warmer day at temperature around 56 degrees. Then you notice the showers start to come in. That's later Sunday night. Could even be later than this at 730 and even a portion for early Monday morning, but it's all rain and then it comes down with more snow and more of our mountain locations. So that's through Monday. So your seven day forecast is showing what's taking place there as well. Tomorrow I see a little bit of sunshine. It's going to be breezy in the afternoon and the temperature is going to be up to 56. Same thing for Sunday. These temperatures are coming up just a bit. As you look at Monday, there's a little dip in the temperature because we have those storm systems pushing through, but we're still pretty mild with the temperatures and you're looking at rain. I don't think we're looking at much snow, but if anything, that's early Tuesday morning. Still some rain snow into Tuesday and the same thing for Wednesday. As you get to next Thursday and Friday, some of these showers could still be hanging on. But if you notice the temperatures, they're basically in the lower 50s and nighttime lows are up too. This is Monday morning at 40 degrees. It's pretty mild in the morning and then you'll see most of those low temperatures into the 30s as we continue for the rest of next week. But at this time, just take a look at this weekend forecast. It's looking pretty good. It has some clouds there, but the temperatures are warming up. Wow, Rick, that looks great out there. I guess you can catch me outside tomorrow and Sunday. All right, we have continuing coverage for you right now of the Iditarod, and we've been following this here on the 208. So yes, a winner of this year's Iditarod was awarded a couple days ago, but it still continues. 25 mushers have crossed the finish line in Nome, Alaska, but there are still four others on the course, including Idaho's Jed Stevenson, and he is currently in 29th place and is expected to finish today. However, unfortunately, it looks like he took a wrong turn about an hour ago, but he is now back on the right track. And as of 10 minutes ago, Jed and his team was eight miles away from the finish line. He's going about eight miles an hour, so you can do the math. He's about an hour from the end of the race. And by the way, the last mushing team to cross the finish line gets $1,000 in the very exclusive Red Lantern Award. And Jed, it has been a blast tracking you along your dream. Good luck to you as you near the finish line. We would love to circle back with Jed soon to hear all about his adventure. All right, sticking with animals, this week we learned a fish who saved the sockeye salmon of Redfish Lake. Have you heard of Lonesome Larry? Well, today we're finding out about a different fish with less lofty goals, but one who has a job nonetheless. Everyone, take a look at your com computer screen, your TV screen, wherever you're watching. This is Swim Shady, who works with the Bonneville County Prosecuting Attorney. Yep. You heard me. The newest member of the prosecuting attorney's team is Swim Shady, and they said that he might be the hardest worker they have. However, they tell us they are worried that he's drowning in all his work. Do we have a crickets thing? I guess not. All right. 
<laughs> Here's a reminder that we're not just on your television. We're all over social networks, too, so you can connect with us all hours of the day. Send us your comments, thoughts, anything. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, we're everywhere. And you can send us an email or leave us a voicemail. You know how much we love those. And if you ever miss an edition of the 208 or you want to show your friends and family a big segment, you can always send them a YouTube link because you can find all of our shows on the KTVB YouTube page. We're going to wrap up the week with comments right after this. All right, folks, let's uh, put this week to bed on the comment Tron 7000. Look at that. That was good. All right, Deborah says, hashtag the 208. Swim shady a bit early for April 1st, don't you think? Yes, April Fool's coming up in, uh, I guess, two weeks, so be... Be aware of any spoofs coming up. Uh, this person says, better late than never with the shamrock and the seven. Yes, eagle-eyed viewers will notice. I got my, my green shamrock sticker on. I added that during the show. Uh, this person says, thank you for the story about the game warden Ellsworth T. That's from Bob. And yeah, Bob, of course, will have an update in May when the official Peace Officer Memorial in Meridian is updated. And this person says, Joe, you can replace Brian. You are much better. He is annoying. Thanks, Robert. I'll let him know. Everyone have a great weekend.